欢迎大家翻到嚟，由香港设计师协会 HKDA 主办嘅环球设计大奖 Global Design Awards 二零二一，简称 GDA 嘅第二支线上评审分享会。Welcome back to the second section of the Judges Seminar of Hong Kong Designers Association HKDA Global Design Awards 2021, and we're so honoured to have invited our prestigious judges to share with us this afternoon. 接住落嚟啦，将会为我哋分享嘅几位国际评审包括有。产品设计里边 ，Mr. Rogers Wells， 当然都唔少得有空间设计里边 ，Mr. Colin Sia， 最佳设计客户奖、最佳用户体验奖、最具影响力奖以及最新创意奖里边，颜耀辉先生。咁喺我哋每一个评审分享完之后咧，其实我哋都有一个问答环节噶。大家好简单，只有喺我哋 Zoom 页面下面，你会见到有一个 Q a n 嘅掣，揿入去写低你嘅问题就得噶啦。Today we are honoured to have invited Mr. Rogers Wells of Product Category, Mr. Colin Sia of Spatial Category, and Mr. Fred Ngan of the New Categories Design Clientele Award, Experience Award, Impact Award, and Rising Creative. To share with us, there will be a Q and A section after each judge's sharings. If you have any questions for our judges, remember to leave your question in the Q and A box. Simply click the Q and A button at the Zoom toolbar. 好啦，事不宜迟，不如等我为大家介绍一下我哋今日下午环节第一位嘅分享嘉宾。佢就系嚟自荷兰嘅产品设计评审 Mr. Rogers Wells. Roger 喺一九九九年同英国设计师。Roland Bird 同埋 Graham Tin 一齐创立咗 GRO Design。GRO Design 喺呢十九年入面啦，一直广泛为市场同埋产品类别嘅行业领导者嚟噶，以及啦，亦都为唔少 A 级品牌客户合作。咁合作嘅品牌包括有 Nespresso、西门子、喜力、飞利浦医疗保健、微软、三星等等。The first judges who is going to share with us is Mr. Rogers Wells, co-founder of the Giro Design from the Netherlands. Rogers Wells founded Giro Design in 1999 together with fellow British designers Roland Bird and Graham Hind. And for 19 years, Giro has worked for industry leaders and A brand clients across a broad spectrum of markets and product categories. The famous brands include Nespresso, Siemens, Heineken. Philips Healthcare, Microsoft, Samsung, etc. And the topic that Roger is going to share with us is the value of good design. Without further ado, I'll now pass the time to Roger. Over to you. Thank you for the kind introduction.、Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, just one moment. Okay,、um, thank you for the kind words and introduction, and, and、um, it's great to be with you all again.、Um, um, I'm going to today talk to you、um, about design, of course. And of course, as any designer、um, who's sitting in this meeting and this seminar,、um, I think it's important to remember a few key things and、um, what what drives us to create. And the power of good ideas, the power of ideas.、Um, Grow works with、um, a number of different、uh, companies on a on a global footing, in all different sectors,、um, and we try to reframe A brand companies. We have a broad knowledge and skills within the team, and we have expertise across various categories. So, we, what we try to do with our clients is deliver holistic experiences. But at the core of everything we do as designers is how we connect, and the word connection is very important. And connection starts with person to person. So if you start thinking about the valued relationships in your lives, maybe your your grandparents, or maybe your children, or maybe a good friend, there's a very close bond and a very close connection to those people. That those values we believe can be transferred to a product. And what we mean by that is the first impression. So when you meet somebody, when you have a conversation, when you、um, uh, get to know somebody, you have these impressions. And products are very similar. 
also with good friends and family, you also have the, what we call the long wow, which is a relationship with um, these products over time. And we're encouraging our clients to really value the products they produce and they develop for their, for their clients. We're now shifting um, increasingly to this age where the human is taken out of the relationship and it's products working on our behalf. Uh, we're doing a lot of projects that grow in this way and how, how the product interacts with another product and how these a new age of autonomous assistance are helping our lives um, in all different sectors. And the human is really on the periphery of this relationship. With that connection, <clears throat> the next word I'd like to, to think about is, is, is the experience. And as I was talking before about the experience with people, there's an experience with products. And experience drives everything we do in our lives, whether it's positive or negative. And you can have that relationship with, with products. A good product has a great experience. Um, we're living in a time where user experience is shifting quite dramatically. And this is a, um, a very simple picture we put together for our clients. And it, along the way, you can see some of the key products grow. We did, we did five years of work with Nokia and we developed some of their leading product designs over a five year period. But of course, that user experience was superseded by Apple and Samsung and there was a shift in user experience. We're facing similar shifts now where we're getting to the autonomous assistance, biometric sensors, big data intelligence. So the whole product relationship is shifting and the way we interact with our product is moving away from screens to voice to touch to intelligence. And this is, this is for design is very, very interesting period. So that experience drives us to the third world, a third word, which is memory. And memory is everything in, in our lives um, that we, we value, those, those precious moments again with the family, those um, uh, great holidays you had, those great experiences. And again, those, those memories can be taken to products. Some of the best products in the world are the ones you really enjoy using. And that's what we want to, we want you to reframe how you think about products. So the memory is very important. As well as the shifting um, uh, possibilities with interaction, there's a, shifting, a shift in user behavior from individual attitudes about, you know, it's all about me to thinking about what can I do for society as a whole? How can I protect the environment? How can I be part of and not apart from nature? And again, we're trying to encourage our clients to be more environmentally friendly, more circular in economy. Because what I what this this statement what I consume defines me, uh, and that's what um, a global trend is happening now. People want to consume uh, with the with responsibility. We're searching for, um, we're searching for new brands. This new generation that's coming up. They're a, they're a, dis, a disrupting, distrusting generation Z. They're digital natives, so they, they, they see everything in, in, in the, uh, the web community. They're influence, influenced by that digital community, and they're looking for deeper meaning uh, and products with value. So this is something that design and business should really, really think about. So with that as an introduction, this is our studio in, in the Netherlands. Um, as already introduced, uh, we have a, a three English partners, but we have a team of international designers, very much European based. We have a, a strong um, graduate program here where we train designers for a minimum period of six months in between their degrees and master degrees. And we invite those team members in because we're very, very influenced by how they think. And what we try to do is facilitate um, the way designers work. Creativity begins with understanding. What we're looking for are these four values from user, brand, business, and planet. Um, we want to delight future users. We want to articulate the brand values of the companies we work for. We want to contribute to business success, but also um, deliver sustainable growth without consuming ecological capital. So it's this balance with business and planet that we're constantly thinking about and the user and the brand we work for. So this is the kind of 
the four pillars we work around when we're thinking about product design. We try to reduce, we try to organize, and we try to create user understanding in everything we do. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about the value of personality and soul. There are two types of um, design we, we believe at Grow. Uh, the first approach is, is very much from this bird, the peacock. It's, a, it's very much a, a design that projects your, your, your value. Um, there's many um, cultures that really embrace the idea that um, the person is, is the clothing they wear, the fashion they have, the car they have, the house they have, everything is projecting their, their value. Um, and this is, this is when design is really amplifying um, the value for, 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 for the users. Um, a product that we designed back in 2007 was a, was a football table, and this is all about the shared experience. And this was a product that we took forward and we developed this football table and it was um, uh, bought by um, art collectors and um, individuals around the world. We, we produced it, we did the interaction. Um, we saw suppliers in Czechoslovakia and around Europe to produce this beautiful football table, 11 again. This is very much a peacock. Another brand that really um, is all about projection is Heineken and we've been doing a great deal of work for this brand. Um, it's, it's a progressive brand, it's future looking, it's a global icon, and it's, it's, it's a far, uh, far reach symbol for quality. And we designed the global signage uh, for Heineken. We wanted to bring a lot of intelligence to the product, but eventually it just turned out to be this very simple, but very elegant um, uh, brand uh, symbol that's on the side of bars and, and clubs. The second uh, design approach is all about becoming a servant. And at Grow, we do a lot of work in this area. We, we spent three and a half years with Sonos trying to deliver timeless product design, um, versatile user solutions, quietly fitting into users' lives, um, this product was a mesh to sound network. And we worked very hard with the team in Santa Barbara uh, at Sonos to develop this design identity. So we, we, we brought the interaction to the brand tag, the brand la label, the, the name Sonos, and then there was sound uh, integrated in. Um, we, so we very much focused on the haptic experience. And we took the company from their first introduction of this product to a second generation of products and went on the journey with them from 2011 all the way through. And the company <clears throat> was revalued at the start of our project uh, to 125 million, but the growth that happened over the next five years was, was, was extraordinary. And design, business, marketing, engineering, and development, everybody co-worked together to develop this. So we shifted the brand from a neutral product to very much a, sim a simplicity and iconic product. So that's what we were focused on, to reduce the elements and recalibrating simplicity. Very, very hard work to do, and you have to work hard with the business to deliver simplicity. That involved rock solid foundations, so creating a, a kind of whole palette of, of language and principles for Sonos, uh, defining a five year roadmap through all different products and categories. And this is something that we designed uh, entirely for Sonos and also worked with the interaction to des design every aspect of the UX experience with the team in Santa Barbara. And as a product design, we we really focus on details and details matter. And this is something I've been very critical in my assessment of some of the projects that we've reviewed together as judges. Details matter in product designs and, and we encourage our designers to, to use less but deliver more. So every detail we brought to the product in this case has a value, has a meaning. That involved going to China to develop the products, to to develop the first products in the line um, to make sure all the tolerances and all the production methods were completely as they should be. So crafting the product through to production is something that we do a great deal of grow design. 
So from concept all the way through to production. That also involved um, designing the whole plug set, the global plug set sets for seven different uh, plugs around the world, but bringing a, an elegance and a simplicity to Sonos. So the first touch point, of course, is plugging in the device. So the third part of my, uh, my talk today, will talk about the value of good design and of course, shifting the dial to becoming more meaningful. What we try to do is with all of our clients um, is to try to deliver relevant in innovation and that's linked to time. It's also obviously creating products with lasting value. And again, delivering products with the long wow. So products that are uh, you know, using materials that are valuable, looking at man manufacturing innovation, looking at system longevity, looking at transitional systems, and of course, optimize for the end of life. And, and we, we talk a lot to our clients about these different values of how you can think about products and how you can innovate in that world um, and I'm going to explain a few and present a few examples to, to you today. So if you look at material impacts, of course, we can reduce the amount of materials we use. We can also design for di disassembly. We can maintain material integrity so we don't coat uh, products with lacquers or, or plastic chromes. We, we encourage our clients to think about utilizing the recycled and reclaimed materials. One of the clients we've been working heavily with is HP over in uh, Boise in the US. Um, and Boise, um, uh, the team in Boise and HP printers were trying to um, bring the printer back into the people's working environment. And what we did here was, was really think about the user and how they're using the product and what interventions a printer could be um, uh, possible. So we came up with a system of linking HP to a company called Quadvart, which are based in Denmark, and they were recycling fabrics and making them into resins and materials. And these were these materials could be used to not only to dampen the sound, but they're very much um, uh, using the entire uh, fabric uh, to make these materials. And we wanted to clad the products in these different materials to match the products to the environment by using these second life materials, because printers are usually predominantly plastic. And that plastic is just brought together and it's a lot of plastic. So why doesn't HP embrace the idea of using recycled materials. Recycled materials can also look great. And we envisage the world where there's a layer of technology and then the recycled materials are cladded, these panels were cladded around the product. So the product had an appropriate language, it had a seamless interaction, and it had a kind of a personality and soul of relevance, moving printers away from a, from a a plastic box into something that is more like furniture. Also a printer that comes to a center of a table, um, so designed for sharing. So the idea is that the, the printer is in, 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 in integrated into a video conference box. So <clears throat> during calls, you can um, exchange sketches, you can exchange information digitally and physically through a, a small printer that rotates in the center of a, a, of a working area. So simply by putting a, a, like a lazy Susan, like when you have beautiful uh, Chinese food, the table turns, but in this case, the printer turns. So what we're trying to do here is be, bring the printer to be part of the office toolbox. So these relevant tools, and again, moving the printer from, a, from out of the hallway and back into people's environments where they could use the printer to help them uh, in, in product productivity. Another way we can look at um, product design is system longevity and designing durability, um, delivering a timeless aesthetic appeal and design for easy repair. Um, 
We've been working a lot um, since 2015 with, 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 with Nespresso to try and shift how the company puts products together. Um, the product that's here on the left was the product that they had, which is a professional product. And we took them on a journey, a three and a half year journey to develop with their developers in Switzerland, Germany, and uh, in Italy, um, a whole new uh, professional uh, coffee experience. So this um, product here is very simple, but very, very difficult to produce. So along the way, we developed a whole interaction experience from when the coffee pad was put into the product, how you could get recommendations. And for example, I could select a cappuccino. There's an animation, an animation of the brewing experience. Then the coffee is poured. There is a, um, a cup support, which is a unique design. There's a range of products that all use the same components. Um, so uh, from a, um, a, a milk coffee solution here, which is this one, disassembly um, designs of fast disassembly for servicing to point of uh, sale, uh, furniture and finishing station and dispenser. This project became um, enormous for us um, and it defined a whole new user experience. Um, that involves, of course, iterative, develop, iterative development along the way. Uh, we create a, we, we, we make a lot of models in, in model shops close to us along the way to test all the details. We um, assess these details early in the creation process and build these products. This is our uh, local model maker. We make all of our models for our clients. We also developed the user experience. So we've shifted our consultancy away from designing products to designing user experiences. So simplifying the interaction experience. So redefining every icon for Nespresso, designing all of their symbols and all of their uh, coffee um, animations. And that's um, very good to create an, an engaging uh, moment in time. So as the coffee is brewing, you can see the components coming together. So you get a, you know, some information on the screen, so an aromatic profile with different uh, notes and flavors. As the, as the cappuccino is made, you get the different elements coming together. And this fills the time when the coffee is being um, dispensed. Uh, particularly important in, in public environments or office environments. But as you can see, as the, as the animation completes, the icon is then produced with the line and then your coffee is complete. Using the screen is very good to fill time, but it's also very important for servicing. So we animated all of the servicing uh, elements. So from uh, the uh, capsule dispenser to the milk area, to the water area, and these prompts help the user to rectify the problem, to refill the water containers or to empty the water container. So whenever the product uh, required servicing, there was a, an animation. So another area we work in is, is looking at distribution impacts. <clears throat> and we, we ask our clients to really consider the size of the product. And we can save a lot of money by just reducing the packaging. For we've been doing a lot of work with LG, uh, LG in Seoul, uh, and also in the London office. And this is showing an example of, again, just good product design. Um, the product here on the left was the briefing, which is an all-in-one computer uh, monitor. And this is exactly the same product, but just with the, with the touch of grow, a touch of personality in Seoul. Um, this product um, uh, designed out the costs, and to do that, we, we invested in a, a die cast uh, anodized uh, supporting foot, very, very lightweight, but this creates the stability um, and also creates an icon and it simplifies to amplify. And to, to make that investment, we simply reduce the packaging by 25% because this package here, the box was, was so, so large. And because of our experience, we were able to tell LG to make the product more compact. And then simply uh, when the user takes the product out of the box, they have an Allen key 
they install the foot and the product is sold. So this delivered growth. Um, the first sales in the first year, 15 million units were, were sold. They, LG made a whole range of products. Um, it was extended into wide uh, and ultra wide and curved screen solutions. So from identity, you can create business value. Again, um, a, another example from Nespresso um, in a price pricing category is um, the centrifuge um, way of creating coffee. Um, this system called Virtu um, uh, rotates the capsule at a very, very high speed to create very, um, uh, very unique coffee experience. And we were invited by uh, Nespresso to design a more compact product solution. So that involved working very closely with an engineering team to reconfigure the entire inter interior of the design. And that's at the heart of good design. So working very, very close with engineering to reconfigure uh, compactness, to deliver as compact a product solution as possible, a very, very challenging architecture. And that meant, of course, redesigning the capsule container inside, bringing dignity to plastics, bringing a new simplicity to product solutions. And again, what we do at Grow is it, design is not involved just in the front end, it is involved in iterative process of crafting, refining color, uh, refining detail. And we, we're very much involved in really this precision work. So from an identity, from a sketch, we then take a product through this journey um, by supporting engineering, supporting marketing, all the way through. That involves creating a world of color. And as you can see here, this is the studio where we create these walls. And this is working with the team to define a palette of colors. Um, color can be a very strong and evocative element within a product design. And it's sometimes over 50% of an appeal can be created from a kind of a monochrome language or a tonsa ton language. But these colors were developed with themes. So we looked at the pro home, the infused darks, the monochrome, the eclectic home. So each of these languages we developed in color had a, had a story, had, a, had, a, had some values which the marketing team could understand. Another area you can uh, think about products is, is, is behavior and use impacts. And, and this is very much intelligent design and encouraging people to be more sustainable. Um, so thinking about smart cons uh, consumption behavior, reducing the, the use of energy, of course. Uh, a product we did in 2005 was looking at this world of commuting and how everybody commutes to work and they have a choice. They can use public transportation. They can sit in, the, in a gridlocked street in their car or a taxi or a bus or they can go on the bike. Um, each of these ways of traveling to and from work has, has its challenges and has its impact. Um, of course, cycling um, doesn't create and use any energy, um, but we were interested in a, in a technology which, which in 2005 was very new. And this was the world of um, electrical scooting um, and using these, these, these products. And of course, in 2005, these, the technology was fantastic, but the product design was lagging behind. They looked like they were developed by um, a small um, uh, engineering group in a, in a workshop. They had no aesthetic appeal. They had no value. They had no personality and soul. So here, as you can see here, the sketch, this explains how we work from a very simple iconic sketch to create desire and create simplicity. So that from the wheel, we come to the seat, we make card models along the way, and then we delivered this product. This, this product we, we developed uh, was, a, uh, was our own project, and this introduced us to BMW and also Panasonic and other companies. But BMW were very interested because we approached automotive design like a product design. Um, and what we, what we think is that you know, product, all technology requires a relevant expression to create the lasting value, but why should these devices that travel at 30, 40 kilometers an hour, why should they have an expression of speed when they can have more an expression of comfort? 
So there's a leather seat here. Um, there's a, um, an icon that's repeated in the wheel. The grip of the wheel is the same for the feet. Um, and very simple interaction experience. Um, and so it, the, the product is more cosmetic in its aesthetic rather than um, automotive. Um, everything has this kind of metrosexual appeal, so it appeals both to females and to males. So from formal uh, expression, you can create desirability. So from, from this, we wanted to create a cultural icon. Um, our goal was that in the 2012 uh, London Olympics, we wanted to have the 20,000 athletes traveling to and from their events on these electrical scooters. Um, of course, a great product for the planet. Um, it's approachable, elegant, and of course, memorable as well. And of course, our goal is with all product design is to make cities more relevant for people. So bring, bring, uh, bring the cities back to life through people walking on the streets rather than having cars in the, in the streets. So the last subject I'm gonna talk about in my, in my talk is about effortless connection. Um, I, I, at the start of my talk, I talked about connection. How, how simple a connection is, 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 is of course, every design, designer's dream, you know, we want to create this effortless connection. And again, this is a good example of um, a product we did for LG. And we wanted to create this, this seamless world between uh, the digital experience and the world behind. So a product that was um, wirelessly connected. So as you shift from your laptop to a monitor or TV, um, the connection is, is simple. It, it's just this, this very, very simple, elegant world. So the, the stand itself is just has a, has a gas lift in a small motor. Um, it's borderless screen. Um, of course, screens are now 3.54 millimeters thick. And we wanted to create this real elegant solution. So delivering more media and less hardware. So in a way, as designers, we're trying to make ourselves almost redundant. So we want to get the products that are very simple and very, very effortless in their execution. This product adapted in orientation, so it had a little articulation, so it could be vertical or horizontal. So depending on the modality and the way you're using the product, it can change orientation. So for viewing the web, it can be vertical. Um, it's a more a multi-channel system um, rather than just a monitor. So it's bringing in different elements from your mobile product, from the digital world, from the TV. Um, so bringing all of those different medias into one simple product. So that completes my story. Um, thank you very much for your time. And hopefully those few examples we've given is illustrating what we believe is the value of good design. And um, it's been a privilege to have the opportunity to talk to you about this today. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger, for sharing so much impressive examples for us. And I, I bet all the audiences and award winners learn from your presentation, what are the values of good design? Just wanna see if there's, we have any questions for Roger at this moment. And a little note for everyone that today's Judges Seminar is also live on uh, Global Design Awards Facebook page. So if you would like to have uh, uh, watch the presentations again, uh, feel free to watch a replay at the uh, Facebook page. So just want to make sure. Okay, I think some of our audiences may want to speak to Roger afterwards privately, if so. So once again, thank you so much, Roger, for your impressive presentation today. A very all. inspiring one indeed. Thank you, thank you, Roger. Bye bye. 接住落嚟啦，啊，我哋咧将会咧邀请下一位嘅评审同我哋分享噶啦。咁大家都知道啦，其实啦，我哋今年环球设计大奖二零二一啦，系特别增设咗四个崭新嘅奖项类别，咁包括有最佳设计客户奖。最佳用户體驗獎、最具影響力獎以及最新創意獎。咁接住落嚟咧，呢一位分享嘉賓就係評審之一嘅顏耀輝先生。
Fred 热衷喺创新科技，而家佢系 Bowtie 嘅联合创办人、联合行政总裁以及董事。咁喺创立 Bowtie 之前啊，共同创立咗 Coherent Capital Advisors 以及 Seasonal Life。Fred 之前喺芝加哥、伦敦、多伦多同埋香港多间国际知名嘅顾问公司担任过顾问精选师超过十年。咁同时咧，现任为亚洲金融技术协会 IFTA 理事会成员兼。保险科技主席、北美精算师协会 FSA 嘅成员、亚洲金融科技师学会 FFT 嘅荣誉会员、保险业監督未来工作小组成员以及香港金融发展局 FSDC 辖下嘅市场推广小组成员等等。The next speaker is Mr. Fred Yan of our new four newly established categories: Design Clientele Award, Experience Award, Impact Award, and Rising Creative. Fred is a co-founder, co-CEO, and director of Bowtie Life Insurance Company. He is a serial entrepreneur with a passion for innovation and disruption. Before launching Bowtie, he also co-founded Coherent Capital Advisors and Seasonal Life. He previously practiced in Chicago, London, Toronto, and Hong Kong as a consulting actuary for over ten years at reputable global advisory firms. Fred is a council member and chairman of InsurTech at Institute of Financial Technologists of Asia (IFTA). He is a fellow of the Society of Actuaries (FSA), honorary fellow of the Financial Technologists (FFT), a member of Insurance Authority's Future Task Force, and a member of the Market De Development Committee of the Financial Services Development Council (FSDC). And the topic that Fred is going to share with us today is. Designing a new insurance company. Without further ado, let's welcome Fred. Hello, everyone. Thanks for introductions.、Uh, let me try to share my screen first. Hi.、Um, can you see my screen? Can you hear me well? Yes.、Uh, we can see your presentation and hear your voice perfectly. Okay, perfect.、Um, well, once again, thanks for、uh, having me in this、um, in this presentation. And、um, uh, first of all, just want to introduce myself.、Um, I'm the co-founder of Bowtie. I'm coming from a very different background. I'm not a, a, a typical designer. I'm an actuary.、Uh, we we do participate in design in a sense that we design a new insurance company with、uh, modern technology.、Uh, my passion.、Um, I'm very passionate in design.、Uh, in fact, I like painting. I like drawing. Um, I'm very in, highly involved in designing the customer journey for the online experience.、Um, we also have、uh, both online and offline. We do have a coffee shop. We do have a clinic.、Uh, we are happy to share、uh, some of the experience that we built、uh, in the last few years. Insurance can be quite a boring topic, so I, I'm going to start off with、um, sharing some of my personal、uh, experience, personal story. And then talk about、uh, why do we、um, build an online insurance company and some of the the design thinking behind behind the whole thing. So first of all,、um, just a bit more about、uh, my journey, right?、Um, I used to be an actuary. This is a picture of me in the last day as a consulting firm. So at that point,、um, I, well, part of thinking is insurance has been a very traditional industry.、Uh, we have seen that even though now it's 2022. Uh, it's still really relying on agents、um, to sell insurance one one to one and face to face. It's, it's very、um, the experience can be quite outdated.、Uh, with the new technology,、uh, with the changing behavior, customer behavior, especially during COVID right now,、uh, we we do believe there's a strong、uh, digital adoptions from all, offline to online. And at the same time,、um, I when 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 I when I was working as a consultant, I was diagnosed with a heart condition that I had to do a surgery. That also、uh, give me an opportunity to really experience the, the medical system, and、uh, and and have to line up for the public hospital. It wasn't it wasn't fun. It was part of my、um, some lesson that、uh, we want to do something to help、uh, improve the the health insurance experience and also help、uh, providing affordable and a、uh, convenient insurance to the mass market. So、um, so I've been in the entrepreneur journey for、uh, seven years.、Uh, we started off doing、uh, building a first insurance tech company, Coherent First, and then Bowtie.、Um, Bowtie is a life insurance company. We are invested by Sun Life and Mitsui.、Uh, we are independent insurance company. So we actually have the、uh, control to design、uh, not just this build product, but we can control the design of the insurance product. We control the balance sheet. We control all the technology system. 
that give us a lot of flexibility to um, not just um, redesign the, the, the website, the, all the customer touch point, but also um, uh, how do we want to manage the, the part of the risks and the cash flows and so on. Uh, so uh, just a very a bit more context about what, what is a virtual insurance company. It just means everything is online. Um, uh, traditionally, a lot of people buy insurance through agents. So we're the first company approved by the insurance authority to uh, actually distribute um, uh, health and affordable insurance uh, entirely using the on uh, online channel, uh, channels. This is a picture that we took uh, when we got first the license. And uh, some of the, the, the people that you see here is from the insurance authority. We actually need the approval to post this picture. And, and you can see the team is relatively young. Um, and uh, later on, we'll talk about some of the culture and innovations uh, that we have. Um, just some boring stat one to give you a bit overview, right? Um, this is a survey from uh, Swiss Suite to understand the, the customer preference. It's, it's very important that when we design something, we actually know what the customer wants. So if you look at, um, just look at the, the left um, bar chart, right? You will see that almost like 81% of the, the, the people uh, wanted to buy uh, simple and cheap insurance online. And then they might um, buy the complex one offline, but you see that 61% of them actually interested to buy online. But if you compare it to what we see in the industry right now, um, there's no official statistic, but um, even until now, when everyone is using smartphone for everything, uh, we still only see that there's only a few percent of people buying insurance online. So the customer problem that we're facing is um, the preference is almost 61% prefer online, but the reality is only just a few percent a few years ago, it was less than 1%. So there's a blue ocean of opportunity out there uh, as part of our job to really capture this opportunity and do a lot of customer education to, to, to let the people know um, how do we provide a direct channel to them. It, online interest is not something new. If you look at, uh, there's a lot of example in US, a lot of example in China and Europe that um, have been very successful. And as you can imagine, um, if we can buy travel insurance online, if we can buy car insurance online, why can't we just buy health insurance online? So it's really a fully uh, online health experience. Um, the fact that you can buy online uh, using a very simple interface, uh, we can provide you with a very high product value because we're able to save the cost, we're able to streamline the process, and everything is digital. Um, you don't need to go to um, you don't need to go to a physical center to do a physical examination, health examinations. You just have to declare your health conditions online. And a lot of people might think if, if you, if for online insurance, there's no customer service, but in fact, it's actually, uh, we have the technology to provide a self-serve model. At the same time, if you have any questions, you can actually call us. So providing that human touch is very important, even for a digital insurer. Uh, we have been keep investing into technology and also keep investing into customer service, such that if you have any, um, any questions, you can still find us. Uh, we have a choice to provide that, uh, provide a, a chat box or using some, some technology to give you an automated response. But instead, we rather um, provide you with, with a, a professional team, a licensed team to talk to you one-to-one uh, -one, um, because we think for health insurance, it's still very important to have CS. Uh, so we have been thinking about how do we design that customer experience with empathy. In terms of some of the product, right, it's, it's all very simple product. Um, insurance, sometimes people think it's very complex. When we talk about insurance, everything is always oh, so confusing, right? So it's very important that we, we build something uh, very simple. So, uh, for people who buy online, they really want to understand the product, how it works. So we provide you with the very basic life and health insurance products. And these are so simple that you can just read uh, the information online. And we have been invest a lot into providing edu consumer education. Like this is actually a, a new um, animation uh, video that we uh, launched uh, two days ago to talk about um, uh, term life insurance. How does it work in one minute? So we have been invest into, uh, as opposed to um, documenting all these policy terms and stuff, why don't we just summarize it in a more uh, friendly and simple languages? It has been a difficult task because a lot of people might think insurance is so complex. A lot of people think we need an agent to explain how it works. But if the part is so simple, if we can keep the user experience simple, we can invest in the consumer educations. We believe a lot of people in Hong Kong are able to just buy it by themselves. We have a, a team that is a, a, a quite a hybrid culture initially. When I say hybrid, because um, when we set up the company, 
it's really a, a, a 50 50 50 percent of uh, the specialists coming from the industry a lot of these people are um, actuaries or claim specialists uh, risk accountants so these are people who have experience in qualification from the insurance sector they're usually coming from the the big uh, insurance company and they join us with a lot of experience at the same time uh, we have a a, a a very young team uh, these what I call the innovator from the startups so these are the people who are involved in engineering in design in uh, branding partnership um, uh, sales uh, marketing and so on and these are the people who usually have no insurance concept and they're relatively young it's, it's very interesting when you have this group of two group of people working together uh, for example when we have to build one of the application right we put a macro doctor uh, sitting with the engineers with a ux designer and also with an actuary so you can see that all of them are coming with a, from a different background you might see them debating all the time but the solution the outcome is always a lot a lot simpler um, because um, we understand the complexity behind it and we try to um, look at it from a different angle we want to um, because the target segment that we we, are, we we have is so young, we have to make the assumption that they have no insurance experience. They haven't been to a hospital before. They haven't claimed before. So we make it so simple that even someone have no experience, they can do it by themselves. So we we combine lots of people uh, people with different perspective with different professional background, and uh, we work make them work together. And I think having this um, diversity is very important in innovations, uh, especially um, for for these innovators from startups. Um, a lot of them have zero insurance background. Sometimes when you have no background, you tend to ask a question that are very obvious, may sound very obvious, uh, because insurance has so many jargon. Um, for me, working in a sector for so many years, it's very easy to overlook that um, this may not be a, a something that are understood by the mass market. So um, when we hire people from uh, who are very young from fresh grad, it sometimes give them a, a fresh perspective that, hey, we have to make it simpler. We have to change the way that we 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 are we, we design insurance. It's not just um, digitizing all the offline forms into an online journey. It's actually fundamentally we design it such that it makes it so intuitive to you. You don't have to read a lot of um, background, or you don't have to need you don't need a lot of context, uh, such that you can actually do it by the, by yourself. And we have been uh, investing a lot into building a new brand. Uh, in in fact, in Hong Kong is is actually. Very, uh, very competitive, like very crowded markets. Um, there is more than 160 insurance company for both uh, life and long life company. So we have to, uh, in, to stand out is actually not easy because imagine we're competing with all these big firms with, with many, many times um, budget higher than what we have that have been, has been in, uh, in Hong Kong for many, many years, right? So um, you will see the way that we designed the logo, like a bow tie logo is, is not traditional. Uh, we decided to choose a pink color it stand for um, more playful, more disruptions. It's very easily recognizable. So if you see your, our ads offline or online, it's very easy that if you see the pink color, it really stand for our brand. Not many insurance companies will choose the pink color. And um, not many insurance companies will choose a logo like bow tie. Uh, but it, actually, the fact that we decided to do something very different is a lot easier to stand out. Um, you know, one, one personal feeling I have is um, in the past before we started bow tie is um, there's so many ads out there, right? Uh, both online and online, uh, especially when there are more than 100 insurance company. How do we stand out? Um, when you couple the logo, it almost as if all the advertisements are the same. So we, we have been thinking about how do we um, design a different, um, not just uh, mission, right? But also the, the, the way we design the, the logo, the way we design the brand color, the way uh, the, the actress that we decide to use, uh, the storyboard and so on. Um, has to be something that um, that that are relevant to the new generations. So so these are some of the thinking behind uh, the logo and the brand design and so on. And um, beside the brand visibility and what awareness, brand trust is also very important for insurance because insurance is about you know if you pay us premiums, if something happened to you, we will pay you claims. It's, it's really a trust. So building that relationship is not easy uh, for startups. Um, but the, in, the, in the new world, when we are selling insurance online, right, um, what, the way that we um, evaluate trust is not just by looking at how, 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 many, how long of a history that you have. Sometimes it's really looking at your online review. It's looking at who is behind you. So we have, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, John Zun, um, uh, the former financial secretary of Hong Kong, to be uh, our advisor. 
So having a big name like John to be behind the firm does help building uh, the brand credibility. So beside uh, the brand uh, visibility awareness, brand trust is something that very, very important for insurance company, for fintech company, because at the end you're paying us money and you hope that in the future we will fulfill our promise. So having the trust is very important. And another thing that we do um, for myself is, um, even though we have a lot of data about the customers from the online platform, uh, is for us as a new company, um, we really want to understand why you buy from Bota, why do you choose an online insurance company? So, um, so we have, this is something that I've been doing in the past, uh, is to call customers every Wednesday, to just call them, ask them why you choose us and so on. Even though it's just a 15 minute conversation for customers, I'm very surprised that a lot of people are willing to give us advice. A lot of people are willing to talk to us, to give us feedback. And uh, I've been doing this for uh, more than 100 calls. Uh, I have to say, I learned so much from talking direct to the customers. So, uh, you know, um, as, 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 a, as a management, uh, we do have a lot of reports coming from different survey, coming from different channels that talk about some of the customer uh, profile analytics, but nothing can be replaced directly from talking to the customer directly because you can actually ask the five why to really understand why you choose online. Is there any different thinking behind why do you don't want to talk to agents to buy insurance? So it allow us to really understand the customer behaviors, customer motivations, and allow us to um, really understand it and then trying to um, uh, consolidate and uh, to formulate a, a proposition, a, a defense trader that, that we think um, that, that, that resonate to the target market the most so that we can use that uh, as our key defense trader, we can use that to market to the public. Um, and, and it turned out that, um, just a, for, uh, give a quick example is, our customers are, as you expect, usually relatively young. Uh, one third of them are below uh, 30 years old. And these are the people who are very tech savvy. They want to do research online. They really want to, they tend to compare many brands before they buy. Um, they may choose us because of the pricing convenience, but lots of them choose us because they think they don't want to deal with, uh, they just want to buy, uh, buy directly while in um, working, that, uh, talking to agents to, to, to buy the insurance. So, so there are lots of behavior science behind some of the portal design and some of the customer journey behind. Um, so I would say um, not, don't just rely on analytics. Um, sometimes it's just much better to, to call the customer, pick up the phone and talk to them directly. And um, to wrap it up, beside the online experience, we have a chance to, build a coffee shop and also build a clinics. Um, the story behind this is um, we, uh, because of COVID, we actually left our co-working space. We used to be uh, uh, having our office in WeWork, but because of COVID, a lot of people started to work from home. So we actually uh, ended up moving to Wan Chai. We have this uh, two floors. The second floor, we use it as a club, uh, 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 our office. We actually don't call it an office, we call it a studio. It's for our um, employee, for our staff to, um, uh, for social, for meetings, for collaborations. Uh, the first four, we decided to use it for um, customer engagement. So we actually opened a coffee shop uh, because we think it's a very good way to, uh, uh, to build an ecosystem, to actually interact. Uh, we, we, we consciously name it uh, both coffee rather than both high insurance coffee shop because you know, if we call that, it might scare people away. We think, uh, you know, come in, we will sell you insurance. So we're very um, conscious to, uh, to, to, to um, to have a brand that is actually under, under bow tie to serve, uh, focus on serving good coffee, will find you with a very different experience. And it turns out that a lot of people, uh, for those who like the coffee, who like the experience, who actually research and learn about the background of the company, and they learn that this is actually uh, part of the bow tie insurance company. And then they find out that um, this is actually a very interesting uh, idea to, to engage your customers. Another thing that we did is the, the clinic. Um, so we invest in having a clinic just very close to our coffee shop. It's also in Wan Chai. Uh, we have um, Chinese medicine doctors. We have uh, um, GP. We have a uh, PCO. We have dietitians. It's, it's really that uh, the fact that we're so focused in health insurance, we want to move forward to not just stop at um, selling uh, health insurance, but also providing health care. It allows us to um, uh, having a more direct touch point with the customers to understand the, the journey to also invest in making them healthier. So we just launched this um, uh, last summer, uh, but uh, it has been a very good experience and also a, a pilot project for us to start moving into the health space. 
I'm just going to stop here. So that is um, a, a quick sharing of my story and also my presentations. And um, I'm happy to take any questions that you have to understand uh, why, you know, the story behind bow tie. Sure. Thank you so much, Fred, for your uh, wonderful presentation. And I think after this presentation, a lot of us know more about uh, the ecosystem and also different concepts of bow tie. Uh, I would like to see if there's any questions for Fred at this moment. 想看看在場有沒有我們現場的觀眾有沒有問題都想藉著這個這麼難的機會提問一下直接在 so I think they're still digesting about a lot of information about this new uh, insurance ecosystem but thank you so much Fred for sharing with us today and thank you so much for being one of our judge for this year's GDA thank you Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. 好,那接下來我們將會在今天最後一位分享嘉賓我們呢位分享嘉賓其實他是在空間設計領域上面擔任我們的評審的那我們很高興邀請到來自新加坡的設計評審Mr. Colin Sia Colin在美國接受建築培訓 被評為年度設計師，同時亦都兩次奪得新加坡設計界最高榮譽嘅新加坡總統設計獎，曾三度獲得金鎖匙獎。國際酒店業最高嘅獎項，Colin亦都被曾經為香港雜誌《透視》評
uh, Ministry of Design is also paired with our ethos, uh, which is a universal symbol for question, disturb, which is a lot of hard work, and then eventually you have something that's redefined. At least that's what we hope to find in all of our projects. And we are very fortunate over the last 15 and 16 years to have uh, enough clients who are also interested in embarking on that challenge with us because uh, as we all know designers without patrons uh, will not necessarily be successful in achieving that uh, end goal so let me start off with a recent project called the city wealth hub uh, for a very enlightened client citibank uh, they are headquartered out of new york and we were invited to join a, a competition uh, to propose a totally blue sky thinking for what their wealth hubs might be. And their wealth hubs serve uh, basically the financial elite of the, the Citibank uh, clientele where the private clients uh, have a very high net worth. And this is an environment for them to sort of uh, meet in and also to meet their relationship managers. So we were in charge of designing the front of house as well as the back of house space. And the question we asked ourselves here was how do we find a new way to redefine luxury in a way that was relevant for today, uh, as well as being able to provide a positive message and not one of overconsumption or overindulgence, but one of balance and sustainability. Um, it has gone on to win uh, numerous awards. Uh, we're very happy to say that. And I think because it, it, it almost finds um, and it manages to take a pulse on what contemporary culture is about and manages to propose a, a, a solution and a scenario for, for this particular genre of work. So it's in Singapore along Orchard Road, which is our very famous shopping belt. It's in a building uh, that has a very particular characteristic. It's a glass encased atrium, as you can see here. Um, and what we decided to do was to stage the process where you begin in a more confined, more controlled uh, lift lobby space. You're greeted by the concierge, and then you are brought through a series of passageways, and then you are revealed to you is the a garden conservatory. And the whole idea of wealth management for us was something to do with um, something that was sustainable, something that was thriving in a healthy, but uh, reasonable, manageable and realistic fashion. And we wanted to use the symbol of botany and landscape and plants to really suggest that also because Singapore is you know, in a very tropical climate, this was something that was appropriate. And the space being this glass encased box allowed for a lot of natural sunlight to come into the space. And so we were able to create um, a lush uh, garden-like setting as a new emblem of wealth, a new symbol for how uh, sustainable wealth can be uh, nurtured, can be sustained, can be uh, nourished, and how it can flourish in a way that uh, is in the long term good for not just uh, an individual, but good for society as well. So you see here a series of meeting spaces, some are casual, some are in meeting pods uh, for all bunch of types of discussions to happen. The planters were quite complex in their uh, elevation as well as their plan. And we worked together with um, uh, uh, interior, uh, sorry, a landscape architectural firm to ensure that the variety of plants, whether uh, they were suitable for this kind of environment um, in terms of the climate, in terms of the orientation. And also we wanted to have a very lush tropical feel. So you see here a meeting pod nestled within uh, the lush garden and the meeting pod is very complex. It has its own air condition system. It's got its own fire suppression system. So it's ventilated, there's fire, fire um, uh, detection system and sprinklers. There's also a curved TV screen and uh, wonderful views out into the space uh, at the clear story as well as in the back of the space. And they're also acoustically completely protected. So when you close the door, you don't hear what's going on outside and you can have very private conversations on the inside. And then the nighttime, the whole space transforms. There are many events that are held here for the uh, the private banking clients, uh, either seminars or uh, cocktail parties um, or product launches, and the whole space becomes an event space. And the space beside the, um, there's a bar as well, is completely transformable. You can remove the furniture, you can have a cocktail uh, gathering here for up to 100, 200 people. Uh, and the other thing about the 
um, question we wanted to ask is what is the banking experience going to be like? And we said it shouldn't be something that was so formal. It should be more lifestyle driven. So uh, very inspired by our other experience and hospitality projects, we created this um, bar. And so you're served uh, uh, either a mocktail or a sort of hot beverage uh, as you meet with your relationship manager. And there are two um, stratas of the private banking system. There is uh, an entry level one and there's also a high level one. And you see here, there is a space that hovers above this uh, conservatory space for the higher level uh, banking, uh, private wealth client to, to meet their, their um, consultants. And it's called the private client center and the palette of materials that we use and the lighting uh, richer, a little bit more dark, uh, so it, it exudes a sense of sort of luxury, uh, and also the scale of it sitting in pairs as opposed to sitting in bigger groups. And the larger bar is replaced by a more concierge style uh, bar counter, and then from the from the apex point of this hovering form, you can look over the conservatory and almost sort of survey the garden, uh, and it's it's quite a nice vantage point. And it's also a bit aspirational. The people who are below aspire one day to be able to be uh, customers of the private wealth uh, management uh, facility on the upstairs because that's a higher level. So you know, there's also that kind of relationship and the psychology that we try to play up in understanding how uh, people think. So here we have a series of meeting rooms. Uh, so complementing the garden pots, there are also a bunch of typical meeting rooms, which are appointed in a, in a palette that complements the outside. And what's nice is, although this is all front of house spaces, including the bathrooms, the meeting rooms, we now transition to the back of house spaces, and they're almost as much square footage for the back of house spaces as they are front of house. And who uses these spaces? It's the relationship managers, the financial analysts, uh, a whole huge army and team of people who support uh, the client, the private wealth uh, clients, and they're typically working in, you know, fluorescent light lit cubicle spaces that uh, are decent, but nothing like the front of house spaces. And we decided that we would take it on as a mission to design spaces under the uh, on budget using the same cost per square foot budget that the typical office space uh, would be allocated to create a series of open office plan workspaces, which would not uh, be any different in terms of feel from the front of house spaces. So there's a seamlessness, uh, there's an inclusivity. We wanted the people who work here not to feel like they're second class uh, to the front of house spaces, that as they move from working behind the scenes and then meeting their clients in the front of houses, they'll be able to have that transition very smoothly uh, and it would allow them to not feel as if they were uh, left out of the experience when they were not in the front of house spaces. So that was very important to us. And it was quite successfully uh, received. Uh, and we, we are happy that we had the opportunity to be supported by a client who was so open-minded. Um, the next project I'd like to show you is much smaller in scale. And it's in a historic shop house. So if you're familiar with Singapore and you know, there are examples of this also in Hong Kong, similar examples. Uh, we have these things called shop houses where they were traditionally used for uh, work and live. So the bottom levels would be uh, for commercial purposes and the top would be for residential, but this one was completely residential. So the whole uh, pre-war, so it's the 1920s uh, to the 1950s, uh, these things were, were designed and built. And so we had our client who co were converting these shop houses into uh, modern uh, co-living spaces for tenants, young, hip, contemporary tenants. So typically, one would take one of these old buildings and want to restore them to their historic beauty from before. But we decided that what we wanted to do was not to look back, but to look forward and almost treat the whole house as a white canvas that would allow for the future life of the space to appear and to be written onto uh, figuratively as well as literally. So that you can see here the shop house is white. And what we did was instead of just painting everything white as that canvas, we 
always kept key elements which were a view back to the past that allowed you to, to build a bridge between what happened before and what the current condition is and then what would happen tomorrow and create this dialogue between all three. Uh, so here you see the entrance, primarily white with some key elements that are retained in their authentic tile and timber uh, design. And then when you go in, uh, the added layer of history is that all the furniture that is selected in here are all recycled um, pre-loved furniture uh, that we have painted white, except we have always exposed just a tiny bit of each of these elements, uh, the old material, either uh, a face of a pattern or flower pattern in a vase um, or a timber pattern uh, on a chair or table, a uh, brick wall pattern on the floor. These are all original, uh, which we want to have like as a sneak peek, as if you peel away a layer to see the old, but the, the contemporary new layer is all this white space around you. And we also had this neon art piece uh, quotation from George Washington um, saying, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. So it's always about looking forward, uh, both uh, in terms of its architecture as well its, as its furniture treatment. Uh, as, you, as you move through the space, you see more and more glimpses of the past, like the timber stair threads, uh, the texture of the brick wall, the pattern on the plates that are used as decoration on the wall. Um, here's a detail of it. As well as in the bedrooms, uh, what we did was we cast almost shadows of time onto the floor where portions of the old floor are preserved uh, and the new covers the rest of it. So it's a very interesting dialogue between old and new, and it's also uh, award-winning, and, and it was became, became very popular uh, as a fashion uh, location shoot for a location for fashion shoots, as well as popular with the tenants uh, who wanted to live in almost this kind of surreal-like space. Um, so that's housing. Uh, we started with office housing, and I want to uh, create find us a new genre. So this is a laboratory genre for a, robo a famous robotics company in Singapore called Race Robotics, uh, which we also helped do the branding for. And it's interesting because the big question here was how do we uh, generate the feeling of fu the future uh, using very simple materials, inexpensive materials, but also very lightweight materials because our client wanted this uh, laboratory to show and showcase and to test the robotics products that they created but it also needed to be disassembled to be reassembled when our client moved from his current location to a new headquarters and so he didn't want to waste the money building this and then discarding it but he wanted to be economically and environmentally friendly to be able to take this down and then to re-erect it so each of these panels that you see are the de demountable uh, lightweight enough to transport because it's just hollow aluminum tubes uh, and to be able to be re-erected in the new um, site. So this is uh, the entry. It's just a very simple uh, entry with uh, um, art that only aligns from a certain point of view. Uh, and it's part of a greater warehouse space. So there's not a lot of budget on the outside. But then as you enter the space, uh, it opens up to this sort of glistening uh, metallic universe. And it was incredibly complex to do. Uh, the simplicity of the materials don't belie the complexity of the angles. Uh, there's, no, uh, mod there's no panel that is modular. There are always slightly different angles or shapes or sizes. Uh, we also managed to uh, integrate the lighting into the material facade of the interior space by finding LED tubes that matched exactly the th thickness and the diameter of the aluminum uh, hollow, hollow tubes that form the basis of uh, the space. So you can see here a close-up detail, and all of them were cut at a certain angle to be perpendicular to the floor. So it creates this very dramatic space, and then the floor plane with just this slightly uh, milky gloss black flooring to reflect the lighting. So it, it looks rather uh, dynamic, visually dynamic as you move through the space, even in its in simplicity. And so this is a view of some of the uh, displays that, that would be used when the uh, laboratory is fully functional. And simple and small plan fitting inside a 
fairly regular square room, and this whole thing could be disassembled and reassembled elsewhere. So moving from a laboratory to an office space, I, I picked this uh, project because it has some very simple but fairly interesting ideas, uh, which, were, which are quite surprising. And it again illustrates the um, notion of questioning, disturbing, and redefining design. So the, the big question uh, we're asking ourselves here was uh, in this design for Leo Burnett, which, which is a famous, I guess, an ad agency. Mm, they told us that one key thing they needed to have for every Leo Burnett office around the world, because uh, it's, it's American based, so they have many headquarters around different major cities, global cities. They, they said one thing we have to have is we have to have a portrait of our founder, Leo Burnett, who long, has long since passed away, but we have to have a portrait of him somewhere. And they showed us examples of how other uh, design firms had designed a variety of other global headquarters, the, the one in Shanghai, the one in London, and they all relied on either typical graphics on the wall or video projections or something that was impressive but not surprising. So we, we thought about it a bit more and we said to ourselves, the nature of what Leo Burnett does is to disrupt the way things usually work. They are very creative, they are very um, left field, they always come up with something that is surprising and strong. So what we said to ourselves is, why not when you first emerge into the office space, the lift door is taken, the, the, this picture is taken from the lift door when it first opens and you step out, uh, and, and it's in an old historic uh, um, turn of the uh, um, uh, pre-war building. Um, you come out and you see graffiti, and we thought graffiti was a very good medium because it's irreverent, it's about uh, rebelling, it's about finding a uh, more brash and bold way to show something. And we thought that was very much in keeping with the spirit of our client's attitude towards creativity. So what we did was we uh, created this projection uh, onto the wall and we got a graffiti artist to paint uh, Leo Burnett's uh, portrait, huge, oversized, almost ghostly in a way, and do it in a style that looks like it's being sketched and not finished. And you can see here the sketch is not finished. There's a little piece missing from his finger, and that's all intentional. Uh, and it's paired with this oversized pencil because Leo Burnett, uh, one of the, the signature elements is that they always have these uh, pencils with their logo on it in the front desk or in the meeting rooms. And so we took one of those and we made it very huge. Uh, and we made it to scale as if it was drawing this a uh, huge Leo Burnett uh, face. And so they really liked that attitude. It's also very inexpensive to do, which they also uh, enjoyed. And then as you come in, uh, there's this wonderful duality between the shell and also the new addition, which is in black, uh, and uh, a sort of bowl of apples. That's uh, also one of their legacy uh, characteristics, trademarks. They would always give these apples and we hung them in, in an acrylic bowl with uh, quotations from Leo Burnett on the wall and in the bowl. And also new ways to view their work through these audio domes so that you could get up close and personal of their work while you're waiting for your appointment. And they were obviously very award-winning and were very proud of it and wanted to find a way to display it. But in the same spirit as the graffiti, we said, no, you, you shouldn't have a typical trophy wall. You need to be more irreverent about it. So why not just put all your trophies in a giant wheelbarrow with a spotlight on it and just keep moving it around the office to different uh, parts of the office uh, as and when you want. Sometimes it's in the public area, sometimes it's in the lobby, sometimes it's you know even in the bathroom. So you know there's something kind of uh, a little perverse and a little bit subversive about that. We thought that was quite funny. So a whole bunch of other spaces that we designed, quite simple, the meeting room spaces, and then also the desks. Uh, and because of budget concerns, we you know just kept it with this uh, wonderful uh, stained plywood uh, and also anamorphic art used to uh, light, light it, bright, brighten up certain spaces. And then last two projects I'd like to show you. Uh, then change in scale completely. So the first uh, series of projects were primarily uh, to do with the interior design scale. So here now we're going down and shrinking the scale to something that you can hold in your hand. So uh, we've done um, 
several product designs before. This is for some jewelry for a local uh, brand. And what we uh, wanted to do was we noticed that when women wear jewelry, uh, they are consumers of a particular design. They like the design, they take design, they wear the design, but they don't contribute to the making or the customization of the design, not, not in any true sense. So what we said was, can we break that code? Can we have a new code? And the new code is um, that we give you a series, a kit of parts made from leather because our collaborator, Bind Artisans, uh, they are leather specialists. And we give you a kit of parts that you can uh, mix and match different colors, but you can also use the system to make different shapes. So this is the starting shape that you might get, but then and, and a series of colors, but then you might be able to reformat them in different ways to create all kinds of unique patterns, uh, some very large, some more compact. You can add more pieces to it. You can take away pieces. Uh, and we worked with a number of local celebrities to, for them to customize their own uh, jewelry uh, pattern with the code product. And here you see a uh, really sort of angular, striking, punchy with the red, suiting this celebrity's personality. Uh, this personality decided to uh, uh, start off by using the, mm, the design that came right out from the box because she loved it very much. Uh, this personality decided to do something that was a slight a change of the weightage, visual weightage of the original product. Uh, so you see a whole bunch of different ways that it can be used. And so in doing so, the jewelry allows the, because of its customization, allows the, the lady or man who's wearing it to be able to um, have some creative autonomy. And we thought that was a very interesting way to question the typical way jewelry is consumed. And then lastly, I'd like to show you a project that we proposed in China for, for the developer Wanka, uh, which was very well received by them. Uh, and it's a mixed use residential project. And it's very interesting because uh, the big question we asked ourselves was this development is right beside the coast where there are some marsh wetlands. That's where like, you know, this a natural ecosystem is created. How can we uh, be part of that wetlands, uh, even though we are not inside it, we're just beside it? How can we uh, move away from just having a view to the wetlands, but make the development feel like it's part of the wetlands? So what we did was to draw the wetlands into the development. We created a series of reflecting ponds. We created a series of circulatory uh, walkways elevated like small bridges and, and, and linkways that set within the marshland that allowed you to pass through and walk within it and return to the development. We also created uh, plans for the building that was a particular organic shape and also a facade uh, that was inspired very much by the patterns that you might see in these wetlands. So you see here the wetlands are sitting outside, but we pulled it in in a, in a kind of conceptual way using the reflecting ponds. Uh, and also the shapes you can tell are very much wetland inspired. Um, and you can see here an aerial view, how it looks very integrated. And it doesn't feel like it's just sitting on the side. Even when you come into the development, we make you cross these bridges. So it feels like you're crossing into the wetlands area already uh, before you reach the residential development. And the windows, uh, they look like they're curves, but actually the glass behind it, they're just all normal straight panels. But we uh, created these openings with a secondary facade layer using these porcelain tubes, uh, which are also colored like the colors of the wetland um, wildlife and plant life. And so you can see there is a sort of a blending of the wetlands moving into the development and it's also up there. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I uh, hope that you found that very quick and brief sharing, a uh, good introduction to the way uh, Amadi thinks about our work and also approaches our work and the solutions it provides. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Impressive uh, PowerPoint, giving us lots of examples about uh, good designs. Uh, I actually received one question uh, from the audience. It's about like for question, disturb, and redefine. 
um, which one would you think it's most difficult or challenging? And which part do you find it's the most enjoyable process for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, well, the first one, which is the most difficult. <laughs> well, uh, if you look at the, the uh, symbols, we made the disturbed symbol almost like swear words, you know, like when someone is cursing, <laughs> you have like this, you know, like the bad words that you say. So we, we, we did that because we know that the uh, process of disturbing is very difficult to do well because you have to really... Uh, not, not use any conventional solutions. You have to think outside of the box. You have to uh, take the effort and time to reinvent each time. So that takes a lot of energy and effort. And sometimes you fail. Sometimes you have to ask the question again. So that's very difficult. It's exhausting, but it's also simultaneously the thing that uh, keeps people going. It keeps us energized. So when you, as a designer, I think many of us will know if you do the same thing again and again and again, your mind just switch off, switches off and your creative heart gets very dry. But if you always pose yourself challenges and you force yourself to think beyond the obvious solutions, then although it's difficult, it's also the most enriching and exciting uh, part of the process, which keeps you alive. So it's uh, the, both the answers is the disturbed part. So it means disturb, it's both like ch most challenging, yet it gives you motivation and it gives you satisfaction and also most enjoyable part once you like yes. settle and overcome it. Uh, exactly. Great. Well, I would like to see if there's any more questions for Colin. Really great opportunity to learn from our... Okay, well, let me see. Okay. Um, oh, we and other judges, uh, Roger, Roger said... Um, it's very, very inspiring presentations indeed, Colin. Thank you. Yeah, I think Roger commented there's a broad palette of design approaches. And I think that's been very one of the very conscious things that MOD has tried to do. So instead of being just a one man's vision, which is me, the founder, and my vision, I distinctly decided not to call the firm after my own self because I knew from the early days that I wanted it to be a collection of thought. So it needed to be about people coming together to democratically find the right answer to things. So um, the broad palette of design approaches is really a conscious effort to not be stuck in one particular style or approach or way of uh, solutioning, but it's just a method of thinking, a framework that allows us to generate a lot of different ideas, hopefully uh, over a period of time. And we've been doing it for you know, 16 years now uh, and the team of 30 of us uh, all are very inspired by that. The other day, I was just asking my team, uh, what caused you to join MOD? And what is the reason you're still with MOD? Uh, and the answer was the same. The reason they joined us was because of design innovation and creativity. And the reason they're still with us is for that. So they, everyone likes the disturbing bit. <laughs> uh. Great. I think that we, we had a really good um, comp Oh, let me see. It's oh, Roger still has have a little bit more uh, add-ons. It's collaboration. It's the core of creativity. Yeah, I think Roger, Roger, Roger is so right because uh, especially um, together with the client, my role as the design director is not to say do this, but my role is to say why do this? And you're proposing that we do this? Like, you know, any team member can say, let's do this instead. And my question, my role is to say, why are we doing this? Is this the right uh, move to make? And oftentimes, um, they know better than me. I might not have the best idea. So as director, it's really exciting because then the whole notion is to keep the collaborative engine running all the time and to keep people participating. And of course, a lot of the time, I have to make the hard decision to say what's right and what's not. But it's always, I always ask my, my, my colleagues, why do you do this? Is this the right move? Why do you think it's the right move? You know, so that whole notion of collaboration is, is fantastic. Yeah. And, and yeah, I totally agree, Roger, as well. Well, I think this gives me really a very great pleasure and opportunity to learn from this distinguished panel of judges today. Thank you so much, Colin. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. You're and most also, welcome. Thank you. And also thank you, Roger, and all the judges and participants today.
。好，咁多位嘉宾，咁啦喺度咧，再一次啦，多谢咁多位国际评审对于我哋 HKDA GDA 二零二一嘅鼎力支持。咁同时啦，亦都要多谢咁多位嘉宾啊，有嚟自世界各地设计界嘅朋友出席我哋今次线上嘅评审分享会噶。咁我哋嘅观众啦，我知道唔单止有专业嘅设计师啦，亦都有唔少啦系嚟自唔同国家嘅设计硕士同埋学士嘅学生。咁希望啦，可以通过我哋今次咁多位评审嘅分享啦。大家可以了解更多优质嘅设计，可以点样为大家带嚟更方便同埋独特嘅体验啦。Once again, thank you so much to all our judges today, and thank you so much to all audience support in the previous months. And we are happy to meet everyone virtually、uh, from the design industry around the world at this judges seminar. And today we have a few masters and undergraduate design students joining us online, and we do hope that the sharings can give you more inspiration about quality designs, indeed bring forth more convenience and unique experience. For the upcoming GDA virtual exhibition and the special program, which will be launched around June, please stay tuned and visit GDA website, www. HKDA GDA two o two one dot com for more details. 咁嚟紧啦，我哋 GDA 亦都会喺六月左右啦，推出我哋嘅虚拟展览同埋特别嘅节目噶。咁公布所有得奖者之余啦，大家记住要密切留意啦。详情咧，大家可以去到我哋嘅 GDA 网站 www dot HKDA。GDA 二零二一 dot com 了解更加多噶。And now HKDA HKDA GDA 2021 Judges Seminar has come to an end. On behalf of HKDA, once again, I would like to wish everyone good health and see you all again in the next term. Thank you for all your support and have a nice weekend. 喺度最后啦，再一次代表。香港设计师协会啦，多谢咁多位今日参与我哋嘅评审分享会，喺度祝愿大家身体健康，期待疫情可以尽快完结啦，同大家可以一齐见面嘅，祝大家有一个愉快嘅周末，多谢咁多位。